So we left off with illuminated letters, and one of the last slides we showed you was these Romanesque and Gothic manuscripts, uh, Paris 1200, and this was really the flourishing growth, uh, expansion in the book market, I'll call it, in universities. We're going to jump ahead in this lecture three. Printing now has come and made a jump into Europe. We're going to be covering around 13th century into the 15th century. And let's start off in around the 1400s. The demand for books has become insatiable. You've got this thing called middle class, which we know really well today, but it's this emerging thing called the middle class and students and growing universities. Um, no more clergy having this monopoly over literacy control. Books which leads to knowledge, which leads to obviously equaling literacy, has become more mainstream. Here's the rub. One book could take four to five months, and it created this need for one of the most important advances in civilization, and that is in typography, which was the equal of movable and reusable type. Being able to what? Start to mass produce books. How many of you have seen in a movies or photos or, you know, really had the, the benefit of being able to go into a really old house and they have these giant libraries or at least a library as a room? No such thing anymore, right? In the uh, early 1400s, that was truly how your wealth was measured. Not money, not farm acreage like we had talked in previous lectures, but the value of the book. Having books equaled what? It equaled literacy. And seeing books like that, if somebody were to come in, held you in a higher regard. In 1424, about 122 manuscripts were housed at the University Library at Cambridge. And with this need for books and the demand what did we have to overcome? Like I said in the last slide, it would take four to five months to make a book. So being able to mass produce these became the next, no pun intended, chapter. Um, we had a steady growth in demand, which had led to the independent merchants developing this assembly line. Think of, of like modern day Henry Ford with the assembly line of the car. This developed this assembly line division of labor with trained specialists. Some would be in lettering, some decorative initialing, gold ornamentation, the illuminated stuff, proofreading, binding, and then again, paper. Samarkand became this paper making center and it spread to Baghdad, Damascus, Egypt, North Africa, and eventually Sicily and Spain. Without this invention of paper, this, this quick, mass-produced, new version of paper, not papyrus or the animal skins, but actual pulp paper as we know it today, none of this expansion would have been possible. And around 2076, the first paper mill was established in Italy. So now that we have these paper mills, we have tradesmen and craftsmen and this assembly line, if you will, and they would be cranking out all of this paper. And one of the ways they identified themselves is with what we call nowadays a watermark, which is a translucent emblem produced by pressure from a raised design on most invisible when it's held up to the light. Um, FYI, go ahead and, and ask to see a sample. We have samples here at the school and I can show you some of those samples. They're pretty cool. But these were, or these identifiers were ways to show where this paper came from and then eventually the designs were um, represented, the or the watermarks represented paper grades. Most of us today, if we ever to do a resume, you actually would use a watermarked paper. It's a higher grade level. Um, 
you've got different linens and laid type papers and they have these watermarks on them and um, like I said ask and we'll show you some samples how these watermarks were made they were designed and produced by a bent wire attached to a mold in paper making and then the designs like I said represented different paper grades now in this particular case they were mermaids but you could have unicorns animals flowers pretty much anything was used um, based on the tradesmen slash craftsmen who came up with the layout and design. How many of you knew that playing cards actually go back to the 14th and 15th century? Basically all the suits actually mean something. It used to be called the King of Kings or the, the Game of Kings, but with this incarnation invention of paper now all of a sudden it now has also become the game of peasants and do you know that poker was considered one of the great equalizers as far as um, literacy goes think about it if you've got this game of poker and most of the time it's between two or more people now all of a sudden what what's it what's needed in poker obviously the face value of literacy to be able to understand what the suits mean and what each card means but more interesting is you need the strategy that inner thought to be able to figure out a solution to beat your opponent right this is a higher advancement of what literacy is is to be able to induce your own cognitive thoughts and strategies of how to get the upper hand on somebody else to have the better of something correct so um, the visual signs on playing cards the suits if you will they were the four classes of medieval society the heart signified clergy spades derived from the Italian spada and it stood for nobility the leaf-like club represented peasantry and the diamond denoted the bourgeoisie right that that upper class and um what you see here in the visual is the jack of diamonds that was created in 1400 and it was made out of what we call a wood block which is really just a carving like a rubber stamp they would use to make the playing cards they would use this wood carving then they would dip that in the ink and then squeeze that onto a piece of paper what you see here is just an example of block printing basically most of them were were devotional prints of saints and they had actual communication value most of them would tell a story um they were typically hand colored the image and the text were cut in the same wood block and as a whole it was mostly pictures with just some type now like the last slide this is actually a sample of early European block printing um, again like I said in the last slide they were usually devotional prints of Saints and they had actual communication value this particular one was from an unknown illustrator and it depicted the legendary Saint um, a giant who carried travelers safely across a river bearing the infant Christ the inscription below reads in whatsoever day thou seest the likeness of Saint Christopher in that same day thou wilt at least from death no evil blow incur it's one of their earliest dated European block prints and the image effectively uses changing contour line width to show form it was about nine inches by 13 inches in total size 
In these next two slides, let's continue to look at some early European block printing. And what you're looking at in this particular slide is what we would call the Bible of the poor. Woodblock prints were combined into books from individual pages of woodblock. And they called it the Bible of the poor in this particular case because of the fact that it was mostly pictures. What did we commonly relate literacy to? The wealthy. We commonly would give the stigma of illiterate people that were mostly equal to being poor. So the Bible of the poor was a collection of events from the life of Christ. It historically had 30 to 50 leaves. It was stenciled, sometimes hand colored to further appeal to the lower classes. Very popular subject since it was due to the Black Death. Um, on the following slide, the next slide, you see here it was called the Pages from an Ars Moriende, or the Art of Dying, around 1466. A montage that juxtaposes the deathbed scene with the subject's estate, whereas you have one demon urging to provide for your friends, while the other one advised, attend to your treasures. And this densely textured text page recommended donating one's earthly goods to the church. Who do you think wrote these books? Exactly. Um, it was really the first documented parts that showed propaganda where they would urge the reader to will one's estate to the church instead of what we do now, right? You want to take care of your loved ones and leaving it to your family. And interesting how they would show the um, demon was the one who was urging to provide for your friends. The church saw it as being selfish and giving your property to the church as being a saint. Crazy, crazy stuff, crazy time. Johann Gutenberg, we've all heard of this guy, right? So Gutenberg was considered the, the father of, of movable type. And he created these typecast molds in the early 19th century engravings that we see here illustrate Gutenberg's system for typecasting. A steel punch was used to stamp an impression of the letter form into a softer brass matrix. And then after that matrix is slipped into the bottom of a two-part type mold, the mold is filled with molten lead alloy to cast this piece of type. And after the lead alloy would cool, the type mold is opened and then the cast would be removed. The, the cool thing is, is Gutenberg was um, noted for creating this, truly this metal mix of 80% lead, 5% tin, um, and a 50% antimony. Uh, pages and um, it was just the right mix so basically what would happen is is let's say that one wasn't cast right he could basically throw it back into the pot heat it back up melt it down and create it again so there wasn't the waste pages were built letter by letter and could hold as many as 50,000 letters at a time ink was typically a mixed with water but was too thin for the metal so Gutenberg mixed his colorants with linseed oil to make them a little bit thicker. Um, what you'll see in the next couple of slides is you'll actually see the breakdown of one of his letters. You can see the marking pin where they would interlock, showing the counters, the uh, bevels, the shoulders, the belly of the type, different parts of how the letter went together in the molds. And then um, there'll be this cool little video. I love this old man. He actually shows you how a Gutenberg press worked. Um, it's so funny. Watch it because uh, 
at some point they ask him questions and he gets so flustered he loses his place. It's pretty funny. Anyway, enjoy. I always like to show this slide because it relates. These are woodcut illustrations from the Book of Trades in 1568. It's a little book that presented over a hundred different occupations. In this particular case, this page is showing, uh, you know, a normal print shop back in that time. Um, if you follow them, the A through G, but take a look at D. I always equate it to modern times, and, and in D, you see this printer, and he is shown removing newly printed sheet from the press while the other one inks the type. But in the background, you've got these compositors that are showing, um, that are shown setting the type at these type cases. Now, in the classroom, we have a sample of one of these cases or drawers, if you will, and they've got one letter style of one particular type size and all the individual letters that these particular compositors would have to gather up, put together to create the words. And like I said in the previous slide, that sometimes up to 50,000 were used. Um, so imagine what that took. This is the equivalent of, again, this, this guy in the back of, uh, nowadays, in the back putting your burger together, right? Not an easy job. Imagine nowadays, if you had nowadays type um, employee back then, where he just put him over the edge and he just said, screw this, and flung all those 50,000 letters up into the air and said, I'm out of here. Crazy, crazy times that would be. Um, so, so look this over, and you can see, like I said, all the different tasks that were involved in producing books. All right, let's talk about Johann Gutenberg and um, his accomplishments, and, and in fact, unfortunately, his tale of woe. Um, what we're looking at here is two of the pages from what we call the Gutenberg Bible. What you just heard in that last video that you watched, or at least should have watched, was that he would print a bunch of publications. He had taken a loan out in the beginning from his brother-in-law, but then as he got bigger, he took out a much bigger loan. And he had this great idea to create and print, not create, sorry, to print the Bible. And it was later called the Gutenberg Bible, around 1450, 1455. And it's a superb typographic typographic piece with legibility, texture, with these generous margins and excellent press work. It made his first printed book a canon of quality that has seldom been surpassed. And a, an illuminator, which is why the margins were wider, an illuminator was added, and they're the ones who put in the red headers and the text initials and floral marginal decorations by hand. So um, what you're looking at at the bottom here is some of the floral arrangement and how it was put together, having to think your way through how this was going to be put together. A big, big feat. I want to say... 200 and it probably had it in the video but I want to say it was about 210 copies and 180 of them were printed on paper and then the final 30 were printed on an, on an upper scale paper a vellum going back to one of those first slides with the watermarks a, a higher quality of paper but um, here's his tale of woe unfortunately the fact that he had borrowed this money from a gentleman named Faust and it was taking so long to put those books together. This false guy, again a money man, ended up foreclosing, suing and foreclosing on Gutenberg. And Gutenberg was pretty much almost finished with those books. It's like pulling the rug right out from under you in that final, you know, 20% before completion. And he took over the presses and took over his shop, hired this new partner to help him finish, and 
I think Peter, I'll talk about it in the next slide. I'm not there yet, but Peter Schaff, Schaffler or something like that. But anyway, um, those two ended up finishing the book. And of course, it made money. They got the credit. And Gutenberg became pretty much a pauper. These books were about approximately 12 inches by 16 inches. There was over 1,282 pages. Each page had over 2,500 characters. So as I said in the last slide, um, this Faust had foreclosed on Gutenberg right when he was finishing up the Bibles, and he took on, yeah, Peter Schaffer. And um, this Peter Schaffer was an experienced artist and designer, and some considered one of the first typeface designers. But um, technically, they took credit for these Gutenberg Bibles. And this is why we never trust a banker, right? <laughs> the rich get richer. Um, I'm just kidding. But basically, this is one of the samples of a press, like you saw in slide number 12. And this Faustin Schaffer became the most prominent printing firm for pretty much the next 100 years. They were producing such great pieces that the French were accusing them of witchcraft. So the next couple slides you're going to see really are just showing the um, creation and the beauty of Faust and Schoffer's detail. The first one that you see here is is a page from the Psalter in Latin that they produced and the red and blue initials are the earliest examples of color printing in Europe. On the following pages, you'll see some other versions, but what's interesting is on the following slide 18, you see this mark at the bottom. It looks like two flags or two crests, and a colophon, or a trademark, from the Psalter in Latin. And these double crests were thought to symbolize the two printers. And it was um, first colophon to appear with the printer's trademark, and a printed date of the actual publication. So one final note on Gutenberg. Um, again, unfortunately, he, he didn't live the life he should have used and got the credit back in the day, I should say, um, that he should have for the Gutenberg Bible and the innovation of all this type. But because he was an inventor and a printer and, and he had that uh, mind... He was able to start producing copper plate printing in the 1450s, which allowed him to um, make a living again. So there was there was a sort of of happy ending for Gutenberg.